So I'm going to give a talk on <clears throat> the broad landscape of machine learning. Uh, this is not going to be a talk on one specific method or one specific problem. Uh, rather, I'll comment on what's happening in the industry, what science needs, and then perhaps how the HPC community can, can help out. So let me start with the canonical computer vision problem. The problem is one of object detection. So given an image, uh, you need to tell me what's in the image. Uh, so perhaps, perhaps there are four human beings here. Uh, what we would like to know next is the identity of, of these folks. So what we see here are uh, <clears throat> Jan LeCun, Jeff Hinton, Yosha Bengio, and, and Andrew Ng. So perhaps you can draw boxes around them and, and associate a caption. Um, the, the problem that computer vision is moving to next is one of caption generation. So I think there are enough smarts in deep learning right now that one could actually say that there are four researchers standing in a conference uh, room. But anyway, just sticking to the object recognition problem for a moment, uh, I think this slide, this particular plot, is what has really launched the field of deep learning. For about two or three decades, uh, the computer vision community has worked on the object recognition problem. Uh, and generally speaking, for the ImageNet contest, which is a standard benchmark that is used in the field, the performance was at, at about 27, 28 percent. In 2012, uh, one of Jeff Hinton's graduate students, uh, Alex Krzyzewski, uh, implemented uh, an object detection algorithm based on convolution neural nets. And there was a, a phase change, essentially, in the performance. Uh, the performance improved by about 15 percent. From there on out, the entire field has started using deep learning, and the performance now is actually better than what humans can do on this task, which is just, I, I think, simply amazing. Uh, around this time, Andrew Ng also started working on uh, a variant of neural nets which has to do with unsupervised learning. So essentially what Google Brain project did was to take hundreds of hours of YouTube videos, and in an unsupervised manner, so not knowing what is in the video, uh, they were able to extract semantically meaningful entities such as cats and dogs and so on. So John Markov wrote uh, an, an article in New York Times highlighting um, you know, as to how many computers it took to find a cat in, in a video, and the answer was apparently 16,000. Um, but, but that aside, I think uh, the, the main point here, and I think this is really what has caught uh, the intellectual interest of the community, is that you could take an unlabeled data stream and extract semantically meaningful objects, which is a very powerful concept. So around that time, I, I was keeping track of this field, and, uh, and it was clear that something was, was going on. Uh, the question that I really asked myself was, well, uh, I mean, this, this all sounds good, but uh, is, is machine learning or deep learning relevant to science at all? And should HPC facilities care about machine learning, deep learning, and, and broadly speaking, statistics? The, the success stories that were reported around that time were, in, again, in image recognition, in, in speech recognition. Uh, but scientific data tends to be multimodal. Uh, the, the kinds of features are, are different. Uh, so can this work? Um, and commenting on the HPC facility and, and DOE research community in general, they definitely felt like there was a little bit of lethargy. I think there was, uh, people weren't quite um, up to speed on, on, on what was going on. So, the applied math community, again, historically, they've led the charge on uh, developing analytics method, but they seem to be content with just continuing to formulate and solve PDs on big machines. Uh, folks on the NNSA side care about statistics, and they care about uncertainty quantification. So that, uh, those aspects are, are moving along. Uh, visualization folks who are now trying to rebrand themselves as data analytics folks, um, they seem to be busy dealing with meshes, and AMR was hard enough to deal uh, I think computational geometry and topology was about as far as they were willing to go. So really, I think in that time frame, DOE wasn't quite ready. Uh, certainly not, not a sea change in, in terms of uh, the adoption of machine learning and deep learning. Now in the meantime, of course, industry has moved forward, full steam ahead. Uh, Andrew Ng moved from Google to uh, Baidu Research Lab. Uh, there's a $100 million per year facility that, that he leads there. Uh, <clears throat> Jan LeCun was hired to, uh, to lead the Facebook AI research lab. Uh, Jeff Hinton and his uh, students were moved from Toronto to, uh, to join Google. Um, every time I drive down from Berkeley to uh, Mountain View, on 880 South, on 101, on 237 East, you see self-driving cars, and these are using deep learning methods uh, internally. So it's not science fiction anymore. This is, this is working. Of course, recently, um, Google spent $400 million in buying uh, 
Demis Hassabis uh, DeepMind startup, um, and recently, of course, it uh, defeated the world champion of, of Go. So on the industry side, I think the writing is on the wall. Uh, I, by my estimation, about maybe billions of dollars have been spent uh, in, in deep learning. And I would say that for this decade, uh, machine learning and statistics are established as the key disciplines. The, the fields of machine learning and deep learning are, um, so the fields of machine learning and statistics are very broad, and deep learning is just one particular method. But at this point in time, I think it's too hard to ignore. I think it's consistently across the board, we are seeing uh, the best performance uh, from deep learning methods. So let's revisit the, the questions that I asked myself, I guess, in 2012. Is machine learning relevant to science, and why should we care? One thing that has definitely changed for the DOE, and I, I hope for other um, uh, facilities, uh, other agencies like NSF and, and others as, as well, is that in this time frame, I think data-intensive science has been established as a very, very important modality. There was a time when, so again, I have climate science as a surrogate for uh, HPC being the source of data. But as we look at other disciplines, astronomy, genomics, high energy physics, light sources, what is happening is that the way in which science is done is through experiments and observations. Astronomers routinely turn to telescopes and, in fact, uh, robotic telescopes to automatically uh, scan the nighttime sky and acquire data. So these are just images of the Palomar Trains in Factory, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument. Uh, the Large Synoptic Scale Telescope will be online in three to five years from now. Every night it's going to collect tens of terabytes of data. Uh, the, the advanced light source and uh, other similar light sources at DOE facilities uh, have several beam lines. And along each of these beam lines, there are uh, particles of, of various flavors that stream through materials which are um, uh, set up here. And then you collect various images. The question one wants to ask over a sequence of images is, what did I image? What does the 3D structure of the material look like? Uh, in genomics, there's been a revolution. Uh, NERSC, for example, works closely with the Joint Genome Institute, and we handle their production pipelines. Every week, tens of terabytes of data are uh, sequenced and analyzed. Um, at this point in time, you can pretty much get your genome sequenced in, in a day, uh, or uh, you know, for a certain given species, you can get that sequenced in a day as well. In high energy physics, the worldwide community of, of various kinds of instruments, well, deploys various kinds of instruments. So this is the Diabe reactor in, in China. If you look inside this reactor, uh, there are photomultiplier tubes lined up along the walls. Uh, particles, neutrinos, and other particles stream through, through the universe, react in this chamber, and leave a trace uh, on, these, uh, on these tubes. Uh, the tubes are capable of nanosecond level precision, uh, but the data is read off in, in uh, millisecond wide uh, time windows. Over the lifetime of a project like this, you can get about 200 or 250 terabytes of data. Uh, the Large Hadron Collider, of course, is the, the grandest instrument in science at this point in time. Um, at its raw rate, data rate, this instrument can produce about a petabyte a second. Uh, there is no um, framework that I know of that can, of course, ingest and analyze data at that, at that rate. So essentially what physicists do is to hard code pattern detection logic in FPGAs around the LHC, uh, which triggers at, at uh, uh, certain energy levels. And then we drop the data rate by six orders of magnitude, get it down to a gigabyte a second. Even then, uh, uh, at, over the lifetime of a project like this, you can easily have tens or hundreds of petabytes of data. So, anyway, so these are all some vignettes of how experiments and observations are, uh, observational devices are producing vast amounts of data. Often, um, uh, five Vs are used to characterize the, the big data landscape in the commercial space. So I've attempted to do that for, for scientific big data. I'll note that the fifth V of value, which is typically associated with monetizing, uh, monetizing user behavior uh, in the commercial space is not as relevant in, in science. Uh, but anyway, so commenting on the other four Vs, um, I think the, the volume aspect is something that we have a handle on. HPC knows how to deal with uh, hundreds of terabytes of data. Uh, the velocity aspect is something we are struggling with. Typically, HPC machines used to be these closed systems that had no notion of the rest of the world, but how do you get a, a large data pulse uh, ingested into the system? So, so that's something that I think we are working on and we'll keep improving over time. 
The veracity aspect is the one that I'd like you to pay attention to because I think this is what really motivates the relevance and the applicability of statistics and machine learning. Anytime you make a real life measurement, there will be noise, there will be errors. And the question really becomes, uh, if I have an inference problem, if, I li if I'd like to infer or ask a question about anything in, in the natural world, how do I handle error and noise? How do I answer that question? So the discipline that answers that question in a principled manner is statistics. Uh, probability is about sampling distributions and getting samples out. Statistics is about giving samples what is the function that produced the samples. So anyway, so statistics is the discipline that answers that, knows how to answer that question. So it's clear, and, and machine learning, I would say, is, is generally about pattern recognition. So those two disciplines, I think, are the reason why we should be paying attention. Also, I'll note that the, the nature of the questions that we are starting to ask in science and HP, in, in science, I would say, is, is becoming more inferential in nature. I collect photon counts in my CCD sensor, but the question I want to ask is, what is the galaxy or, or the solar object in, in the sky? I collect sequences of genome data, but I'd like to know what the long uh, uh, sequence might be. Um, so, so, anyway, so I think uh, the fact that the questions are becoming more inferential in nature, that's why we need statistics and machine learning. Uh, also, I'll note that um, moving data, managing data, those are, of course, important prerequisites. But you're not going to get a Nobel Prize for just moving a petabyte. Um, it's, the it's the analytics that is the key step, which will result in scientific insights, which will get you the Nobel Prize. So, anyway, so I, I think analytics is going to be absolutely key uh, in this new modality of data-intensive science going forward. So um, I spent the last 18 months or so in looking at the broad range of problems that we have at NERSC, and I've just to be concrete, I've cherry-picked some of the top analytics problems that we have. Again, when I, when I attend conferences like Strata, Hadoop World, and so on, I, I somehow walk away disappointed with the quality of use cases that, that folks have. And I feel like that's precisely where science is strong. We have some of the most amazing use cases across all scales in science. So essentially what I'll walk you through here are some very concrete problems which, which start at the scale of the entire universe and, and go all the way down to subatomic physics. And all of these problems have, of course, an associated uh, data management challenge, but there's also a beautiful statistics or machine learning problem, which is at the crux of, of solving this. So, anyway, so problem number one is on taking all telescope data that we have, so the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, polymer trains in factories, on and so forth, and creating one unified object catalog. Um, again, in the time frame of our lives, 10, 20 years, uh, roughly speaking, the universe is static, roughly speaking. Um, so every time we put up a telescope, it's not that the sky has dramatically changed. We should be able to keep on improving our estimates of what's in the sky. So anyway, so uh, this, is a, uh, this can be formulated as a graphical model problem. Uh, this is probably the largest graphical model problem in science. Uh, so it's uh, a lot of interesting opportunities for doing inference at scale. Now, one thing that we do, of course, in, in uh, HPC is to run simulations of the universe. So it's easy now for us to set up uh, trillions of particles, initialize them, uh, and then run, run them out to, you know, for the length of the universe, which is about 16.7 billion years. So essentially you have a, uh, a trillion particle simulation. Every time step is, is 30 terabytes. And now the question is, well, the parameters that I put in for characterizing the, the cosmology constants, were those the right parameters? Somehow I have to compute summary statistics from the trillion particle simulation and compare it to known observations through telescopes. So the challenge is, do clustering, do two-point correlation, do three-point correlation for trillions of particles. Um, there are projects in the DOE that are now starting to approach 10 trillion particles and higher, but really the number of codes that can actually, the number of codes that can do clustering and do three-point correlation at this scale are, are very, very few. So moving, so DOE unfortunately doesn't care uh, in, in terms of scales. Uh, we, we care about the entire universe cosmology and then we come down to planetary scale phenomena. Uh, so in climate science, uh, one of the problems that we care about is, is how the weather is changing. Um, so specifically, the conversations regarding climate ch change tend to be quite simplistic in terms of global mean quantities like annual temperature or sea level rise. Uh, the kinds of problems that we would like to get at are uh, storm systems. 
Do we expect storms like Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Sandy to start making landfall more often in, by the end of the century? Or do we expect these storms to uh, you know, behave statistically in, in a similar fashion to what's happening right now? So given a 100 terabyte long simulation of data, I would like to pick out, so similar to the object detection problem in images, I would like to pick out storm systems and track them across time. Once I can do that, then I can start quantifying getting at the uh, statistical distribution of these storms and see if, they, if that changes. So similar to object detection in images, the analogous problem here would be activity detection in video, except we have a million pixels, and then at each pixel we have 30 or 40 channels. Uh, the RGB channels that are in video, uh, we just happen to have a very high dimensional space. Uh, moving on to, I guess, what I would call artifacts of civilization, the, the fact is that we produce a lot of publications to the extent that it's very, very hard for us now to keep track of maybe what the, where the frontier of science is. So surely, you know, short of logging on to pubmed.nis.gov or you know, finding the most promising cure for cancer or using Google Scholar to download um, you know, what might be the most promising photovoltaic substance, it should be possible to use a system like Watson, and Watson is you know, just an exemplar here, uh, but it should be possible to use such systems automatically create knowledge-based graphs from large collections of, I mean, you can pick a domain, it can be just genomics or material science, but we should be able to create a knowledge base and then ask questions and answers of such a knowledge base. Um, so I should be able to ask, is gene X correlated with gene Y? And the system should be able to come back to me saying yes or no, 80% probability, here are the top five papers that show that's the case. Um, moving on to um, individual humans and behavior of uh, organs. So you may know that there is neuroscience, I think, is, is going through a renaissance right now, thanks to the Obama Brain Initiative and the Human Brain Initiative. Uh, one problem that one might ask is, well, so say we create this device that can record from a, mil a million channels, what does that tell us about neuroscience? What does that tell, tell us about how the brain works? So at NERSC, at Berkeley Lab, we are trying to create what I call the Stephen Hawking device, which can basically record uh, data from the brain. So you essentially implant a chip into the brain that is responsible for speech planning. And then you try to decode what a person might be trying to uh, articulate. Amazingly enough, it turns out that we have collaborators at UCSF who have uh, patients walk in, they implant this chip on the brain, uh, they have them read Alice in Wonderland for 30 minutes. So we have input data and then we have speech. And now if I could only learn a mapping between the two, uh, I could create uh, the Stephen Hawking device prosthetic. Uh, and it turns out that we can apply deep learning and we can get some really good performance for, for this problem. Um, moving on from uh, you know, the, the function of uh, essentially organs to the function of cells, biology of course certainly lags behind physics and chemistry in terms of its uh, predictive capabilities. This is a real irony because right now, at least at Berkeley Lab, we have dozens of kinds of microscopes that can image um, tissues across many wavelengths, across many spatial scales. So somehow we need to make biology more quantitative. Um, so again, being able to automatically extract cells or different types of components of, of cells um, and ask questions of the type, what are the size frequency distributions of various cells? and ask that question systematically across entire experiments or collections of data sets that have been done will be the first step that will help biologists to make predictive models. Um, moving from cells to genes, well, to proteins, to genes that, that encode uh, you know, how, how a cell might form, I would say that um, there's been a tremendous amount of progress in genome sequencing and assembly algorithms. Um, I think the open challenges here might just be in the metagenomics context, wherein you don't know how many species are there in, in your uh, data set to begin with. Um, the, the challenge, I think, looking forward, as was just, just mentioned, is going to be, fine, I have my genome sequence. What do I do with it next? What do I use it to predict? So personalized medicine is something that's certainly uh, coming on the radar. Uh, a problem that I think is a little more tractable in, in the shorter term time frame is, is personalized toxicology. So given a matrix where we have chemicals along one axis and species along the other axis, I would like to know if a certain chemical is going to be toxic to uh, a certain species, say human beings. Now, unfortunately, all chemicals cannot be tested on all humans, um, and we, we just don't have data. So we have a, a partial matrix in some cases, and we would like to impute the rest of the matrix. 
So much like you know, the Netflix matrix completion problem where you have uh, users and movie recommendations, uh, the problem here is a little more societally meaningful in that if I am an industry and I'm going to put out uh, you know, a certain product in, in my environment, will it, what, what is the impact that it's going to have on the environment? We would like to know that. So moving on to uh, material science. Um, um, again, we would like to know if I care about a certain problem, what is the substance that might be most efficient in capturing CO2 from the atmosphere or creating a, a highly efficient solar cell uh, object? How do I go about exploring the space of you know, 10 to the 57 materials? So we now, at Berkeley Lab, we have collections. So there's something called the Materials Project. We have hundreds of thousands of materials which have been simulated. Uh, for those materials, their electronic structure, their properties are really well characterized. Given that data set, could you be smarter in choosing the next material you want to simulate? Uh, that's, that's essentially the problem. Finally, moving from molecules to uh, atoms and what composes atoms, I, I brought up a picture of the LHC. Um, essentially, what you get is a large time series data set. Um, uh, and you would like to know, in an unsupervised fashion, ideally, I mean, I, I'd be happy if there is a supervised solution even, uh, you would like to know what type of particles uh, exist in this collision. Um, so we are looking at uh, deep learning approaches based on both, again, both in the supervised and unsupervised context, and we seem to be getting some really good, good performance. All right, so, um, so anyway, this is just a quick rundown of uh, you know, my top 10 list. Uh, I'm sure if you talk to you know, Rangan at Oak Ridge or other folks at, at uh, the NSF, you're going to get a slightly different list. Um, uh, so moving towards maybe synthesis, um, we would really, I, I think it's time that we characterize the broad landscape of machine learning problems in science. Uh, and I will note that there are challenges in taxonomy, uh, both on the method side and also domain specific uh, terminologies that are used. And also I think to bring this conversation back to HPC, this, this particular crowd, um, we really have to understand I think what the key computational motifs are, uh, given this, this uh, broad taxonomy on the method side. So, uh, so I'll, I'll, take some, I'll take a stab at attempting this. Um, so in terms of the broad landscape of problems, um, I've essentially listed uh, various statistics and machine learning tasks along the rows. And then along columns are 10 science areas. We have many more um, in, at NERSC, at, at Berkeley Lab. I talked about 10 of these cross marks, uh, cross marks but there are, um, uh, there are many, many other problems to, to work on. I should note that um, while there is a lot of hype around deep learning, uh, deep learning can probably only solve classification, regression, clustering, and feature learning problems. So there is certainly a lot of room and scope for other methods in statistics uh, that one, and, and, uh, and machine learning that one should bring to bear. So I think one has to be cautious. I, I think deep learning can probably solve these four rows really, really well uh, across the board. Uh, but one has to be cautious in that uh, we do care about interpretability. Uh, we do care about um, uh, being able to answer why our, our you know, machine learning task is, is doing well. So deep learning isn't quite there yet. So I think statistics and machine, and machine learning broadly is still there's, there's a lot of uh, room uh, for, for innovation. Now, commenting on the, um, uh, the motifs, uh, so again, bringing this back to the, the hardware that we you know, actually run on, on on big machines, on, on our HPC centers. So starting from top down, we have a range of use cases. Uh, we are starting to establish a taxonomy on, um, uh, you, you saw that taxonomy in, in the last uh, slide on uh, what, what scientists need. I'll note that not all algorithms are scalable. There are brain dead approaches that involve order n cube, order n squared uh, problems that, uh, approaches which are not going to scale to terabyte size data sets. So I think it's very important that we identify methods that will scale. I think one of the appeals of deep learning is that it seems to scale really well uh, as you throw more and more data at it without overfitting. But anyway, so at the level of scalable algorithms, I think that's where the applied math computer science community is. But you know, when we talk to hardware vendors, Craze and Intel and so on and so forth, it's really hard for them to understand what, what do you mean about you know, sparse coding and what is variational inference all about. That's a, it's a completely different world. So somehow we have to translate the language from, to something which is a little more computer science-y, I, I guess. So, so, anyway, so similar to, I think, the Kalela motifs that were done in HPC, it's time that we thought about um, 
the relevant set of motifs in the big data space. Uh, this is not the first time that this idea has been presented. Alex Gray and others have, have thought about this. Um, so far, I think my investigations have led me to conclude that dense and sparse linear algebra are definitely there to stay. Uh, those are key for deep learning, for instance. Uh, graph methods are, are definitely uh, you know, one important motif as well. But there are these higher meta-level motifs uh, about um, how you initialize your stochastic search, uh, how you randomize your, uh, uh, the selection of your you know, matrices and whatnot. So one, I think we'll have to pay attention to these meta-level motifs as well while we think about efficient algorithms. Um, so I think um, a core design exercise uh, based on, so starting from the motifs and thinking about the constraints of hardware in, in that uh, you know, many core chips are here to stay, the, the hierarchy is deepening, the cost of data movement is an issue. I think it's time that we thought about a core design exercise that started on the motifs and thought about what might be the ideal hardware for, for data. All right, so I want to summarize um, challenges. Um, so I think there are going to be cultural challenges as we uh, transition. Uh, at this point in time, I think DOE is struggling with the fact that machine learning doesn't quite cleanly fit into either computer science or applied math. But I think we'll, we'll just overcome that obstacle. I think scientists are going to make so much noise about this in the next few years that program managers will find a way to make this work. Um, you know, there's a lot of statistics terminology from the last 30 years. Computer science, you know, the machine learning crowd and HPC has their own taxonomy, but I think we'll, we'll converge on something soon. Mindshare, I think, to me, is the biggest problem because I think, frankly, um, there's so much funding from the industry at this point in time that uh, attracting the best academic and industry talent is going to be very hard for us. Uh, technically, um, I think the, uh, the big data ecosystem, of course, has you know, evolved independently of HPC. That's where all the machine learning li libraries are. So, uh, it, we'll need some leverage to get them to pivot our way. Um, we have aspirations of convergence in software and hardware, um, uh, but I think uh, we need to do a better job in characterizing what we mean about, what we mean when we say data and machine learning first. So certainly there are a lot of opportunities. Um, I think this crowd, you know, we, we understand storage, hardware, networking. That's, that's our strength. There's no reason why we shouldn't be able to get these algorithms to run fast. Uh, we have the science problems. Uh, I think software is where the challenge is. Uh, so both doing research and developing new methods, but also developing, software, developing uh, and deploying production software is, is key. I will note that you know, after having been in 15 years at, in science, uh, often you see fields stagnate. Um, uh, so people keep at it and you know, work becomes incremental at some point. The most exciting discoveries are often at the intersection of sciences and methods. Uh, we just don't know what the limits are for deep learning at this point in time. So I think as we interface deep learning, machine learning statistics, and apply them for data intensive science problems, uh, we're going to see a lot of uh, exciting discoveries happen in the near future. All right, so I'm going to conclude on the slide that I started off with. Uh, you know, these four people have driven the field of deep learning uh, for the last three decades, and it's time that they, uh, you know, got, got their credit. Um, I think the question for this community is, um, are we going to applaud from the sidelines or are we going to actually stand next to them and make stuff happen? Thank you.